Thank you. Hello. Again, nice to be back at PGF UK. And this time, we're going to talk about design, because we put the TDD bug into people, and they go and try to do TDD, and can't really appreciate TDD if they don't understand the motivations. Why are you doing TDD? It's to get good design. It's not to test anything. Stop talking about testing. So let's talk about design so we can appreciate that. So you thought I wasn't going to talk about TDD, did you? <laughs> you fool. So, <laughs> so this is me. I work at a company called Invica. Like, thank you, Kieran, for introducing. I also contribute uh, a little bit to PHP Spec, um, and I tweet at their handle. So feel free to talk on the, on the webs, the internet, and things. So my talk today is about the motivations behind TDD, the design motivations, and um, understanding that uh, some, some of the principles that would help us appreciate uh, TDD. And I want to touch a little bit on the responsibility-driven process and how does that fit in with uh, barely enough design or uh, simplicity and how does that fit in the whole Agile thing, and why doing focus on responsibility, you get simple design rather than more complex, obtuse things, and a bit of the evolution of thinking around that, but with some code. So don't despair. You're going to see some code. Yeah, so we start with the big picture. Uh, we tend to go to big design up front. Uh, maybe not so much today. I don't think today when we're doing a project, uh, we have many people doing entity relationship diagrams. Do you do entity relationship diagrams? Any of you? Still? Some of you? Okay. <laughs> entity relationship diagrams, and, uh, and then we, once you have the entity, then you dump into some, um, um, automate some process, and you create some. There was something called Oracle Forums. Did any of you work with that? With, <sighs> you remember that? You, you design the whole data model and then pff, dump, and then you have your application. They call it rapid application development. I call it rapid application disappointment. <laughs> so why, why people do that? They, they think oh, if you do the design properly in the beginning, you are safe because later on things are going to get really difficult. So if you understand everything you need right from the beginning, uh, you, you're safe, you know? It's hard to change things later. It's better to understand what you need now. So the, uh, the developer with a waterfall bug infected, the project management come to him and say, hey, here's uh, some uh, specification for you. And he look at that and say, well, you're not giving me the whole picture. I know tomorrow you're going to change your mind and going to give me something else. No, give me the whole picture. I want the entire spec. You're going to change your mind tomorrow. That's the waterfall developer. And the project manager, I don't know, you know, we have to adapt quickly because the business, you know, we have to strategical. And no, no, I want the whole understanding. I don't want you to change my mind. I want to sit down and write my code. <laughs> so give me, oh, look, there's a door. <laughs> look. <laughs> give me the whole picture. Give me the whole picture. So that's the waterfall mentality. Um, we need to think about everything before developing. Otherwise, something is going to come up in mountains later on. Oh, we didn't think about that. So we have to know everything before. We need to make sure we didn't miss anything. Something's going to some get through the cracks, and we you know, have to redo a lot of parts of our models. Yeah? Does that resonate? Do you remember hearing things like this? Yeah? Familiar with that? OK. <laughs> Why do you do big, big upfront design? Ah, this, this is just the way we work here, you know? Just shut up and do the way we work here. There's many motivations why people do big design upfront. And what is the problem? You know, it's like very organized way of working, you know? You just think about everything, talk to people, let's get the model right, let's write our entity relationship diagram, beautiful, and then, you know, you can even uh, create our active records for each of the tables, and then, you know, the application is basically done. You just need to write the controllers. It's very, very simple. Why not use it? Okay? 
And especially if you come from, you know, if you, if you were a procedural programmer before, before you were like an object-oriented programmer, you're very comfortable with that. It's very, very comfortable to work with. You know, you have all the data available for you. You know, all the classes full of getters and setters open to you. Say, ah, come to me. All the data available to you. Get everywhere, set everywhere. They like that because they're familiar with you know, global scope, right? Remember, when you're writing C programs and you have the main function, you can access all the structures from wherever you like. So that, that's good. That's, you know, ah, I remember that. It's good. I can use the same thing with doctrine. I can just put getters everywhere, and I have the same procedural code. I don't need to worry about this overall thing that they're writing about. So they're very comfortable with that, that data-driven. It's good. But there, there are problems. You know, you have this. Open objects, gets. I'm doing your role and put gets everywhere. Get this, get that, a, bit, a bit, little bit of this, a little bit of that. Let me get some for that, some of that. It's like there is no secrecy, no encapsulation. The object is telling you everything. You know? You're macro managing your objects. You, you, know, you, need, you need to know what the object have inside, and you decide for the object what he's going to do. That's very, very procedural, very, very old school. Yeah? Is there any problem with that? What? It's, it's, okay, it's, this is good, Marcelo. What are you talking about? It's so convenient. And some people have thought about this. There are many old papers. This, is, this one is from 1988. You know, people talked about these things before. This is not, not new. In this paper, they, they came with, <clears throat> they, they talked about the law of the meter. Some of you are familiar with the law of the meter? I see that some heads going like this. Yes, okay. So, the law of the meter is very simple. But this paper talks about it in a very complicated way. It goes like this. For all classes C and all methods M attached to C, all objects with M such a message must be an instance of classes associated with the following classes, the argument classes of M or the instances variable classes of C. You can try to read. That's why people didn't understand a lot of the meter for you know, 20 years or something, because they, <laughs> they, they complicated too much. Basically, what they mean is that this is obscene. That's what they mean. Why? It's, it, it's obscene because it's, it hurts a very fundamental principle <coughs> of design, which is inappropriate intimacy. You wouldn't put your head inside of a mouth lion, would you? The mouth of the lion? <laughs> to see what is inside? That's what they're doing. They're putting their heads inside of the mouth of the lion. The lion, lion's mouth, you know? Get this, get that, get that. Inappropriate intimacy. You are so intimate with the object that you know how the object gets to the data and inside of the data, inside of the data to get some behavior somewhere else. Okay? So what's the problem with that? The first thing is that it leads, if you have gets everywhere, the first thing is that you're going to use the gets. That's the problem. If you, have, if you put gets everywhere, you're going to start writing uh, your code based on structure. The naming of your methods is going to be all based on structure. You're, not, you're going to forget completely about the domain methods and domain naming, because you can just use the getters. That's the, the first problem. Second problem is fragility. If you want to change something on, for example, in the ignite method, if you want to change that, what's going to happen? <laughs> Everywhere else where you have get this, get that, get that, all that code that is all uncontrollable, you don't, it's not encapsulated, it's available. All that code is going to break. It's not localized, you know? You have given a lot of people responsibility to deal with that. So now, if you change your mind about Ignite, or how do you do Ignite, then you're going to have to change everywhere you use code like this. So it's fragility. It's got fragility. Also, viscosity. You know, your project managers come to you and say, hey, uh, um, can we do another sprint now? No, we need to do one sprint of refactoring. Do you know the sprint of refactoring? We have to stop everything now, it's a mess, <laughs> and we have to clean everything. But, you know, it's because it's so hard to do the right thing, that's, you know, it's viscous, it's, the code has become so viscous. You want to do tests during development, you can, you cannot, you, can, you want to do, you know, you want to do dependency injection, you can't, everything is very sticky. Everything's glued together because you're using this Data access, direct data access. And this regard for encapsulation. You're not using the, even though you may have some methods based on the domain with good names and good, good interfaces, you're not using those interfaces because you can do directly, you can use the data directly. 
So you completely disregard encapsulation object oriented. You don't need any of that. OK? So all the complicated uh, the, the law of the meter thing basically boils down to only talk to immediate friends. Don't go getting, 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 getting things. And you know, you put the data where the behavior is. Okay? Minimize interactions between objects. So much easier. If you want that behavior to be there, that's where you access the behavior. Just bring the, the data there. Okay? Put the behavior and data together. There's another name for that. It appears in another paper around that time as well, which is tell, don't ask. That's the name of the principle. Put the data where the behavior is and minimize interactions between objects. Okay? So this is basically we're talking about uh, things you can do to simplify the code. There is a concept that we've been touching upon from the beginning of the class, which is uh, the enable, enable or simplicity. What is it that enables simplicity? And what is the connection uh, of simplicity and data-driven? Why data-driven uh, make things so complex? Um, so that the, con the concept is the concept of encapsulation. This is Ron Jeffries. He's one of the signatories of the Agile Manifesto. He's also one of the founders of uh, extre Extreme Programming. He, he was in the community for a long, long time. He's a long, long time programmer, C++ programmer. So uh, on the Ward Cunningham wiki, he writes there on, on a simplicity, somewhere on, uh, on a simplicity uh, topic. He says, you know, get it done in 10 minutes and move on. Save all this big sort implementation from when the gold owners decide the system is too slow. So get it done and do the, the, all the other ideas that you have later on when the sponsors of the project are saying that this is needed. And then he, but that, he doesn't end there. He says, encapsulation will save you. Encapsulation will save you. If you, write your <laughs> if you write your program with encapsulation in mind, then you can change later on. Then you, you, can, you have the choice to change things later on. It's not that you disregard the future. You have to write the code now thinking, how can I write the code in a way that I can, in the future, and, um, improve and, and, and add other pluggable elements. Okay? This is possible because OO has in it uh, a very fundamental principle, which is the principle of abstraction. When I first hear about abstraction, in my head, well, when I hear abstraction, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about this. You know, this women, Picasso women all broken down. And that is for me, this is the, the thought that comes to my mind. What is, why, is, why is this considered beautiful? Why in art? They, they think it is something like this. I was puzzled for many, many years. Why? This is you know, one of the biggest work of art of all time. Picasso, you know, <laughs> what is Picasso doing here that is so beautiful? Why abstraction is so beautiful? If you look at the dictionary, there's something really nice in a, in a definition of abstraction that really strikes a, a bell inside of me. Abstraction is a freedom from full representation. Comple you know, you're free. You don't have to represent the whole thing. You're free. The project manager comes to you and say, I want you to create a, a, print me a report in XML. You don't have to create a report in XML. You have to create a report. You're free. It's free. You just create a report. Free. And then you attach an XML uh, implementation. Yeah? Because you're using abstraction. Abstraction enable encapsulation. Abstraction enable composition. Abstraction enable polymorphism. Without abstraction, you have nothing of this. So it's really, really powerful. An extra interface is not more complication. It's less complication. It would allow you to change your mind. That's amazing. It's a very, very strong principle. Very, very nice. So for example, let, let's get a, an example here. So I'm doing, I'm doing, a, I'm writing, I'm rewriting PHP unit, for example. Every, everyone familiar with PHP units? It's a testing framework. That's, there are others, but this is one. <coughs> so I'm, I'm rewriting it. So I, this is my first implementation. Simple. I have test runner, and I'm attaching to the runner the, the, 
the formatter, which is just going to print a dot if the test passes, and it's going to print an F if the test fails. Does that make sense? So you pass the test to the run method, runs the method. If it catches an exception, then marks fails. If it doesn't, then it marks pass. Yeah, straightforward. So I'm doing everything right here. I'm, I'm, I'm doing the dependency injection. My code looks beautiful. Object oriented. Yeah? No flaws. What's wrong with this code? It's, it's perfect. Looks, I'm using exceptions. I'm going, oh, whoa, it's nice. OK? But, but in, uh, in this case, my customers are the developers who are going to use the, the code. The customers, they know. They know everything. They know everything. <laughs> Uncle Bob said that all the customers, they, every, every night, they go together in this conference room, and they, they talk with their evil little minds, and they talk about the things that you did in your code that is going to break in the future. And they come tomorrow and ask for that feature <laughs> that you can't implement. They know. They know what you cannot change in your code. And they can come tomorrow and ask you to change exactly that part of your code. <laughs> they know. So in this case, I have a special customer. And he comes to me and say, I want another formatter. And I look at my code. My code is, I had coded the progress formatter as a dependency. What, why, what am I going to do now? What am I going to do now? I know. I know. I just, I, I just extend the progress formatter. Inheritance for the way. Object orientation means inheritance, right? I just extend an, uh, the progress formatter and create my Nyan cat formatter. And I'm good to go. I just, you know, dependency injection. I inject a dependence. And it's all good to go. It's all problem solved because I use dependency injection. I'm safe. I have beautiful code. Yeah? Sounds good. It's all very logical. Remember, remember, for you to be free, you need abstraction. You're not free here because you don't have abstraction. You have to be free. You need to be free. You need to be free. So you need abstractions to be free. OK? So let's create an abstraction. OK, so what, what format I'm passing here this time? What formatter is this? Is this an ENCAT or progress formatter? Hmm? It's an abstract formatter. I'm free. I can put whatever I want there now. <laughs> I can put whatever I want. I can put an XML formatter. I can put, I don't know, uh, <sighs> you name it. I can put a what? <laughs> a JUnit formatter. Free. So that's why, that's why abstraction is important. That's why we need it there. And we need it there for encapsulation, for composition, for all the kind of things. When do we abstract? Do we abstract everywhere now? Marcelo said abstraction is good. So all my classes are going <laughs> to implement an interface. Is that right? <laughs> no. <laughs> Design is horrible. You know, writing code is nice, because you just copy paste from the web. <laughs> but design is not like that. You can't copy paste design patterns. You can't, you can't. Even though you want to, you can't. You have to use your brain, and that's a mess. That's, that's, that's a pain in the ass. So you need to know things. You need to understand, OK, I'm going to abstract roles that I know that can change. I'm going to look for things that can change in my code, and I'm going to abstract roles like that. OK, so what is an interface? An interface is a role and a bunch of responsibilities. OK, so when you create an interface, you, you're identifying a role, a, a, an abstract role in your system. And attached to that role is a bunch of responsibilities. That's what you define in a role. A role is something that has responsibilities. OK, so that plays really well with the concept of a role. You have all these objects that are talking to each other. All of them are identified roles in your system, and they accomplish things through that interface. You just ask to the top one, hey, I want a neon cat, and then he's going to talk to everybody there and then give you back a neon cat at the end, and you don't even know what happens. And an interesting thing is that they don't even know what happens. The classes don't know what's going to happen at runtime. It's the, it's the messaging, the networking of message exchanges between the objects that's going to give you the behavior that you want. That's the beauty of a wall. 
that predictability you, you, uh, that you have in procedure pff, is gone. You can read the procedure code and you can see what's going on. In you know, no, you don't know. You know, oh, you just know at runtime what is what is the behavior that's going to happen when you plug everything together. So when you when you when you look at your test runner, runner you know that you need a formatter, but at runtime you don't know which formatter you're going to have. Only in runtime you know that which formatter you're going to have by looking at the code you want to know. So that's the principle of substitutability. I have a problem with that word, substitutability. Substitutability. So the Gango 4, they liked a lot the, this, this concept of substitutability. So that's when you decide to add an abstraction. You decide to add an abstraction when you spot concepts that can change. Uh, but you have to make decisions. You have to make decisions in the code. And sometimes you have to think about, should I do this now? Should I do this later? And that's very tough. That's, that, that's one of the things that you, you gain, you get used to when you get used to design. It's a very nice uh, concept uh, by Preston Smith um, when he, he talks about uh, decide later. Uh, make the community at the last responsible moment. Okay, that's very, very important for simplicity. If you don't need to decide now, don't decide now. <laughs> decide at the last responsible moment. That doesn't mean that you uh, ignore things that you know is going to come in at the end of the sprint. And if you know it's going to come at the end of the sprint, and it's now is the last responsible moment, then what are you going to do? Now you're going to add abstraction at the last uh, responsible moment. You can start with the concrete implementation, and as soon as it becomes a problem, or you foresee the problem, then you can uh, amend the design. So, but you need to think about these things when you're plugging things together. You have to, that's what design is. Design is um, designed so that you can commit later, so that you f your architecture is free. Okay, so the freedom the agility, that's, these things come from the Agile community. They gi this gives you agility. This gives you the, 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 the chance to change your code and evolve your system at runtime. time. That's what it, this is doing. OK, so OO, that's this also the, the fabric of OO. There are the elements of OO. When you look at uh, the things that you build in your system, you're going to have um, two main concepts. I like this idea. It's from the <clears throat> Uh, the, uh, the Growing Object-Oriented Guided by Test book. If you haven't read this book, I recommend you, you have a look. It's a very good book. So the guys talk about this two, the, the kind of separating these two ideas. That you can represent both with classes, by the way. You can represent objects with classes. And you can also represent values with, with classes. But the objects, they're quite special. The objects are quite special because with objects, you, uh, they have identity, they have state, and they have behavior. Okay, so if you you can, if you if you in, in PHP you, you have uh, some method that allows you to get the ID of the object, so you can compare objects to see if the same objects because they have identity. They add that thing in the memory. They have an identity in a physical sense. Also, they have an identity can be represented as an identity with something that can be persistable and it can recover later on in, in time. That's the concept of entities. And the object can have state. And they encapsulate the state so you can ask stuff for them, which is the behavior. So they know what to do with the behavior. Okay? So entities have all of those things. Entities, they have identities, they have state, but people strip away all of the behavior of the entities. Make them a bag of setters and getters. And put the behavior in the controller. I don't understand. This is the perfect place to put the behavior of domain objects. Okay, so entities, they have identities, they have state, and why not use them in, in your design? This is a perfect place to use them in your design. So let's talk about the process to get there, to get responsibility-driven uh, design. So we've been talking about the data-driven design a lot, putting it down, data-driven is bad, and we're giving some, some reasons why it's problematic. So what is good about responsibility-driven design? By the way, this is not just a new DD, it's something very old. Again, everything is being told in the past. We just, I don't know why we don't listen to these people. <clears throat> there has to be the kind of a, you know, enlightenment of software development in the 80s. And we're now recovering them. We've been through a middle age of software development or something. 
so th this is Rebecca Wirth's book, and she talks about the resp she is the, fir the first DD person, responsibility driven design, came came about uh, 1988 or something. So she says that right in the beginning of the paper, the full benefit of a bow can only be realized if encapsulation is maximized during the design process. So you have to think of encapsulation when you're designing your, 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 your objects. Okay, so, and Ward Cunningham, don't talk to me if you don't know Ward. Uh, <laughs> no, seriously, if you don't know this guy, you have to read, go back and read everything about Ward Cunningham. He is the godfather of everything we know. The guy who, behind the design patterns, extreme programming, test driven development, Everything that you think someone else did, he actually, he did it. Um, so he, he created a, he's like, a, like, he had to train some people in object-oriented programming, and his students were all like coming from procedural school. So he found a way of training them into object-oriented programming. And this is the CRC cards. Yeah, have you used CRC cards? Oh, good, good. Mostly Vika hands, but some other guys also. <laughs> cool. So CRC cards are very, very good. If you are learning to do responsibility driven design, once you do CRC cards for a while, you can ditch them. You can just use tests. This is to help you think the responsibility driven way. Okay? So what is the process? You identify scenarios, think about the scenarios, think about use cases, uh, just the same way you do in your normal process. That doesn't change. Okay? Once you understand what you have to do, what you're listening for in this case is not names and adject adjectives and kind of uh, modeling the real world thing. You have listening to behaviors. What is it that my system has to do? That's what you, your antennas are on. My system has to do this. This is the behavior. So identify scenarios and start writing down responsibilities. Someone is writing down all the responsibilities on a board. I have to do this, I have to do this, I have to do this. You don't have to do this for the whole system. You do this for the bits of the system that you're working on, that sprint, okay? It's not big design up front, okay? Small design, just for the things that you're working on. Think about the responsibilities, write them down. Once you have the responsibilities, then you think about roles. Not the other way around. Don't start with the roles first and then put responsibilities to them. Okay, you start thinking of the responsibilities first. And if you, if you go through the roles first, you end up, you're going to end up with loads of data bags. You're going to have roles that have no responsibilities at all. And you go back to your entities with getters and setters. Forget about roles. Think first of responsibilities. Once you have responsibilities, then you find out what is the best place for these responsibilities. Then you start thinking about entities that would have behavior. Yeah? Things that actually make sense. Once you've done that, then you, you, in the middle of it, and you, you're going to identify, okay, I need some values here, I need some values there. Some of it is actually going to be data bags, but you can represent them as, as values. So more, about, more about that later. Once you've done the exercise, you have your CRC, what you're going to identify is that your roles, they become, doing, they may be doing too much. They may be doing things that belong somewhere else in your system. Okay? And how do you know that? Because they are transcending boundaries. They're, if you think about your system has layers, some of the things in your system are really the business. This is what my business does. This is the domain. And this thing is completely different. This is, uh, this is my database. This is my web. So if you identify the boundaries of your system, then you can attach adapters. You can attach the abstractions between the roles. And this is the process in which you find your collaborators. And it's really nice to do this with CRC because you do that very, very quickly. So you, you get a whiteboard. If you don't have a whiteboard, get a whiteboard. <laughs> if the manager just put a whiteboard in the meeting room, you take it back again and put it back <laughs> near where you work. And defend it with your life. Whiteboard is almost as important as your keyboard. Okay? So you, you put a list of I'm not sure if that's going to work. So you put the list of, you see the, no, he doesn't. <laughs> Go back there. So that's the list of your behaviors on the top. Everyone is, someone is listing all the behaviors. And once you have all the behaviors, use the right column to attach roles to it. Yeah? 
Now they, they have a nice place to go. You thought about their behaviors, they go, to, they go to a nice place. So once you have that, then you start thinking, okay, my region validator is doing too much, I'm gonna de delegate some of these to my region, to my uh, uh, relative position calculator, whatever that is. And you're delegating stuff, you're imagining, you're imagining your boundaries. Okay, this doesn't belong in a domain, this is something the database is gonna do, I'm gonna imagine. That. Dream your boundaries, okay? So, and then you end up with cards like this, CRC cards. You have, on the top you have the name of your role, then you have responsibilities, and then on the right side you have the collaborators. So roles, responsibilities, and collaborators. This is the, this is the fabric of object-oriented programming. The fabric. Okay? So someone wrote a blog post and say, I know what TDD is. I'm writing a code and I'm dreaming the objects. And Uncle Bob said, no, no, no. No, no, no. You have to, you have, to, you have, to have the, the, the objects in your head. What you're actually dreaming is the boundaries. You're thinking the limits between the boundaries. That's what, that's what you have to focus on. You have to have an idea what, what are the boundaries of your system. You have that, that you have to know beforehand. Okay, I have this layer. This is my domain. This is my persistence. This is my UI. This is, you have to know that beforehand. You dream your boundaries beforehand, and then everything fits in when, once, you, once you understand the responsibility of your system. So something like that. This is called the dependency inversion principle. Have you heard about this? Yes? Ah, oh, this is so beautiful. PHP community is this. It's unbelievable. Asked that question five years ago, and <laughs> no hands. So dependency inversion principle is that you, you have these higher level modules, they cannot depend directly on the lower level implementations. Okay? If they are in a lower level layer, they don't depend directly on them. They will depend on an abstraction. Yeah? And the lower level module will implement the abstraction. So that's how they, that's how they talk together. Okay? So basically, your controller will depend on a repository interface, not in a doctrine interface or anything. And then the lower level will implement that. Okay? Are you desperate to see code on? <laughs> yeah? Okay. This is, this is some code. So here you have a service that it's, it looks to find out what is the competency dictionary of a certain learner. This is a domain that I'm very familiar with. I don't expect you to be familiar with because I, I work in the learning development department. <laughs> so I, I know that this is, a, you get your learner, and then for that particular learner, I have to find what is his dictionary of skills. What is the skills that he needs as a, as a learner? Okay? So this is how the, 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 this, the, it looks very, very simple. You have a constructor that constructs <laughs> That's all it does. And then you have a method with the behavior. And that behavior is pushing down to the lower level implementation how to do stuff. So we have a service that's a competency, competency finder who has a dependency on, on a finder and asks the finder, please find this guy for me. And the finder, of course, is an abstraction. Okay? So that's dependency inversion. You depend on an abstraction, and you're going to have like a doctrine repository or something to implement that. And your controller, you get your service, you inject your service, and you have one-line controllers. Yeah? My mom doesn't believe me. I say, Mom, I have one-line controllers. She said, no, you don't. Yes, I do. I have one-line controllers. Look. Ah. Yeah, one line, one line control. That's all you need. If you if you push the responsibilities down, you end up with one line controllers. You can show your mom; she wouldn't believe you. But yeah, push the responsibilities down. Responsibility driven. And this is uh, this is the concept of enti an entity that doesn't look like a an open whatever uh, <laughs> with getters and setters. You don't need the getters and setters. You know, if you need, there's, there's beautiful uh, solutions now for persisting, persisting entities, if that's your problem. So you can create, you create an entity, in this case it's a named constructor. You know, I'm not using just a constructor, I'm using a named constructor. Um, in this, I use the, the, the skill 
And uh, I'm going to rate something. I'm going to rate someone his skill on a particular uh, skill area. So I, I just call skill rates, pass the skill, pass the learner, and pass the rating. And I save that into a list of events. And I can completely forget about that because then the persistent layer will iterate through all the objects that needs to be persisted and will take care of that. My entity knows nothing about that. And that's, that's called event, event sourcing. So there, there are other solutions. This is a really, really, really nice way of um, getting rid of you know, the worry about persistence. So you don't need, yeah, Marcelo, you have a getter there. Yeah, but you understand that this getter is, is it's completely, I'm not exposing the state of my object. You with me? I'm not exposing the state of my object. I'm, I'm, I'm allowing uh, to the persistence layer to persist my object, and that's really one of the, fun the responsibilities of my entity anyway. Okay? And you thought you're going to go without TDD. <laughs> now, TDD. Just, then I'll let you go. <laughs> so, where does TDD fit in all of this? So once, once you, you, you do CRC for some time, you appreciate what the process is to create responsibilities, to create nice interfaces, to create, to push down the responsibility of your objects, to tell how objects communicate with each other. This is what TDD is about. Okay? And if you do this for a while, then you can appreciate it. Okay, so what are you going to do? You're going to use scenarios and examples to build your domains. So anyone already using something similar? Do you do acceptance testing or, you know, BHAT or Gherkin or something like that, something similar? Okay, so you use your scenarios and to try and have conversations around the domain straight from the scenarios and you can start building understanding of the responsibilities related to your domain straight from the scenarios. And then um, think about Dream your boundaries. You know, once you have, you have implemented your domain, the next stage is to dream your boundaries. Understand where do you're going to have to invert dependencies, where you're going to have to lead abstractions in your design. That's very important, where the abstraction goes. Then, um, with that understanding of design, test-driven design will become like second nature. You can do that with, test, with, with your tests. You can describe things with your tests right from the outer layer, outside in, all the way to the unit testing. And it would be useful if you identify what's the right tool to use at, what, at all stages. <coughs> PHP spec. <coughs> so if you if look for tools that help you in the process, of course, um, the tool is just going to make visible where your limitations are. The tool is just a tool. But uh, look for tools that can help you in the process. And so, in conclusion, what we, what we talked about. We talked about the motivators behind design and the distinction between data-driven and responsibility-driven design and why data-driven design actually takes you to more complex code. Even if you're not doing entity relationship diagrams anymore, you're still doing big design up front if you're using open entities and um, getters everywhere. And then we talked about the principles of simplicity and when to decide things, when to, you have to defer decisions, and when you have to make decisions, and why you make decisions, such as adding an abstraction. And then we talked about how do you go about then implementing a domain using the responsibility-driven approach. We talked about the CSC cards. It's an approach that you can use to do that. And then link that back to TDD. What's going to happen is that once you have the CSE cards, you can see, wow, I could have done that with my tests. And then your understanding is going to fit in with TDD. And you, then next time, you're not even going to need the CSE cards, hopefully. So this is me. I am Marcelo. I work for Invica. I think I said that before. <laughs> I do some stuff with PHP spec, and that's me on Twitter. I appreciate your time. Thank you. <laughs>